Hey, how's it going? Welcome to our online service. Welcome to LifeBridge. So stoked that you're joining us, whether you're watching this on a Saturday, a Sunday, Monday, maybe it's Thursday, maybe it's a busy week and you're watching this on Thursday. Whatever day it is, we're glad that you're joining us today. My name is Brendan, I'm the youth pastor here. I've got a couple things to tell you about, some stuff we wanna invite you to, some stuff we wanna let you know of the inside scoop on, because how great are inside scoops? Ooh, and now I want ice cream, ice cream scoops. Ice cream scoops, inside scoops, all the scoops right here. Check out some announcements. A couple weeks ago, due to rain, we had to cancel our men's feast event, but don't worry, we've rescheduled it to February 21st, and we wanna invite you. It is from grades 11th all the way up to 105 years old. So whatever grade you're in at 105 years old, we would love to have you. It's gonna be an awesome event. Craig Van Dyke is teaching. We're gonna play some battle bingo. We're gonna hang out and just grow in the Lord together and grow in community. So any men out there that are watching this, or if you are watching this and you know any men, tell them about this event because it's gonna be awesome. We would love to have you there. Whether you've been watching all of these online services we've been putting out or if this is your first one, if we don't know you and you don't know us, you're not getting our emails and we don't know who you are, we would love to. And not because we're trying to collect emails to sell them to get money or something like that. We're not, we don't do that at all. We don't even send any spam emails. What we do is we send you emails to keep you connected and updated on what's going on. And so that way we can love on you. Just this last weekend at our in-person service, we were able to look at our kind of congregation and all the names and emails and we thought, hey, who wasn't here? who's like not been here for a while. And we got to drop off Valentine's Day gifts and things like that. So if you fill out the connect card, it's a great way for us to know you. And if you have prayer requests or you wanna to talk to a pastor, all those things can be done in the connect card below. So if you fill that out, we would love to know who you are and we wanna keep you in the loop and get you some scoops. Huh? Yeah, remember that? It was just a minute ago, yeah. We would get you on the inside scoop of what's going on. So fill out the connect card below in the link. We're so stoked that you joined us today. If you are here and you would like to give to LifeBridge or what God is doing through this church, there's a link below in the description for our giving. We would love to partner with you in that way. We're so excited you joined us today. We've got worship and teaching and a lot of good stuff coming up. So hope you have an amazing day. Hope today is just a blessing in your life and we hope this service is also a blessing to you.
the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the King is alive. Thanks again, worship team, just for leading us in a time to really focus on the Lord. Uh, respond back to Him, how necessary it is for us uh, to take some time out of every day, really throughout the day, to just acknowledge God's presence and, and His gifts uh, for us and uh, just His, his involvement uh, in our lives. I want to stop and pray as we start this morning. If uh, many of you heard through our uh, prayer chain that uh, Bill and Vivian Eisenach, her son Todd, passed away suddenly this week, just 43 years old. And at this point, uh, as I'm recording, not sure what the causes are, and uh, what just a you know an unexpected um, you know tragedy that we want to pray for Bill and Vivian and the family, Todd's wife, and um, so I'm gonna pause and pray for them as well as just whatever's happening in in your life. Just to pray that the Lord be blessing you and and meeting you and your your need. Lord, we just thank you for this morning, opportunity we have to meet with you, to hear from you. Uh, we think of Bill and Vivian and just the loss this past week of their son Todd. And we know that naturally we're not wired as parents to, to say goodbye to our kids. But Father, we're grateful uh, that you understand as a father what it's like to lose a son, that you uh, understand grief, you understand sorrow. And uh, so we turn to you in those moments. And I pray that you would sustain both Bill and Vivian as well as Todd's wife and the family, the friends that are being impacted by this passing. And Lord, for so many of us, it's been a season of, of loss, of discouragement. So Father, we just pray that you would continue to be faithful to us, that we would continue to find our joy, our hope in you, not in the circumstances around us, that we know we have an eternity that's secure for those of us who know you, Jesus. And so teach us this morning from your word. Uh, teach us from the example of Daniel's life as well as others around us, Lord, that we might be more like you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, we're in Daniel chapter 11. Here it's our uh, second to last week. So next week's our last uh, chapter in Daniel. We'll be transitioning into uh, Matthew 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount, and, and learning about some of the foundational basic teachings that Jesus came to deliver. I'm um, looking forward to that. But I want to finish this section, these last sections. We're, we're on the final vision. This is part two of the last three uh, sections or three chapters of this book. Last, uh, next week will be uh, the final vision, part three. Uh, we're going to look at this section a little differently than we've been throughout the book of Daniel. I'm not going to read every uh, single verse in it. And I think it's okay to do that sometimes. Give yourself permission to skim through certain sections. You know, it's helpful to get a bird's eye view of some portions of Scripture where you want to read it and understand it. And then there's other times where you really want to stop and zoom in and, and really meditate and take some time on a smaller portion of Scripture and really meditate and think and allow certain things to, to, uh, to sink in. And this final prophecy... Uh, that we've been hearing about all throughout the book of Daniel, especially the second half, brings some final clarity to um, to what uh, Daniel's been receiving uh, his entire life and passing on to us. And uh, if you're following along in your notes this morning, you have a, a, a downloadable uh, version of our, our uh, online service, and uh, there's some notes in there. The first point this morning is is we're going to look at prophecies concerning Persia. So in, in chapter 11, verse 2, we pick it up. It says, Now then I tell you the truth, three more kings will appear in Persia, and then a fourth, who will be far richer than all the others. When he has gained power by his wealth, he will stir up everyone against the kingdom of Greece. Now remember, Daniel's hearing this vision the last you know, years of his life. He's getting a glimpse of what's coming. And we now have the benefit of looking back and seeing many uh, of these prophecies fulfilled. Um, now, I'm going to tell you at the beginning, we're going to skim over large parts of this chapter. Uh, but I have a great resource on all the historical filaments that are going to be mentioned in the following verses. Um, if you're interested, just email me. You can email me at mark.staples at lifebridgesd.org. Or just go to info at lifebridgesd.org. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll make sure I forward you a little uh, some pictures of how so many of these verses correspond to events that have already happened in history. It's really fascinating. 
Uh, looking back at history, especially in this first verse, uh, uh, verse 2, that we're looking at today, we, we know the names of these future kings that Daniel was getting a, a picture of. Uh, the fourth king we now know as King Xerxes. You may have heard about him throughout history. He's the one known in history for his great wealth, as well as his military campaigns uh, and final campaign against Greece, as referenced and foretold here in Daniel. Remember, Daniel's reading this and writing this before these events happened. Uh, we know in history now that he attacked Greece and in an attempt to take over all of Europe. I was reading this week uh, that he really would have been most, one of the most powerful and prominent kings, but he decided to try and take over Europe and, and go through Greece in order to do that. Uh, but he was turned back. But this uh, it really was his political downfall, and it caused heavy losses on both sides and, and really ignited a hatred of Persia throughout all of Greece. Now, many liberal critics, as you're going to see as we uh, review some of these, you know, uh, liberal critics of the Bible can't believe the exact accuracy of so many of these predictions. I mean, they're precise. Um, they can't or won't accept the fact that Daniel wrote these prior to them happening. So they, they surmise that somebody must have written it after they all happened and then somehow backdated them or attributed them to Daniel and tricked everybody into thinking that they found Daniel's writing ahead of time to somehow you know, surprise or you know, prove that there's a God. But we actually know through a lot of, a lot of criticism and through uh, you know, finding throughout history when these uh, writings were written that Daniel wrote it wrote these prior to them happening. And so what an encouragement um, and uh, that, that Daniel received these as a warning to God's people, but also was a witness of God's power, his wisdom, his sovereignty over time and history, really over everything. And so what an encouragement that, uh, you know, as we start off this final vision, we hear this, you know, quick version uh, of the prophecies con con concerning Persia, and we know that they came, came, to, came to pass. The second thing you'll notice in your notes is that Daniel continues with prophecies concerning Greece. We pick it up in verse 3, and he says, Then a mighty king will appear. This is after the three kings and after King Xerxes attacks Greece. This is that a mighty king will appear who will rule with great power and do as he pleases. Now, after he has appeared, his empire will be broken up and parceled out toward the four winds of heaven. It will not go to his descendants, nor will it have the power he exercised, because his empire will be uprooted and given to others. So we read these verses about the, the kingdom of Greece that is coming. Uh, the mighty king mentioned here is none other than, than Alexander the Great. We've been reading about him in some of the previous chapters in Daniel. Uh, and Alexander really is, is impassioned to strike back at Persia and really overthrow Persia because of uh, their attack on Greece earlier. And, uh, and we also know that uh, following Alexander's death, one, one author wrote this, all of his descendants, in, including his wives, his children, even his distant relatives were murdered. And the kingdom was divided up into, into four parts, uh, taken over by these four generals, as referenced here again in this final vision and earlier in the book of Daniel. So we see this uh, prophecy again, this final you know, clarity and clarification that this is going to happen. And again, God's going over through hundreds of years of history fairly quickly in this chapter. The third uh, point you'll notice in your notes is that uh, Daniel reveals prophecies concerning Egypt and Syria. And this is where we're going to do a little review. Verses 5 through 20 uh, give us, you know, dozens of prophecies about future leaders and, and events that are going to happen between these two countries. We're introduced to these new characters, these two new kings in this, this section. They're labeled as the king of the south which in Daniel's day would have referred to Egypt and the surrounding area, and the king of the north, which would have referred to Syria uh, and the kingdom uh, you know, just, just uh, near uh, where Daniel is writing from. Now, uh, according to many people who've worked through these prophecies, there are at least 135 different prophecies contained in these first 35 verses of Daniel 11. 135. And they've all been fulfilled in history. And, and really, there's a lot of common agreement about that fact, that they absolutely came, came true, that Daniel wrote about them because of the vision he got from 
God and from Gabriel and from Michael. It's remarkable that there's so many precise predictions and prophecies that all came to pass. And Daniel wrote about them and received them, you know, long before they ever happened. Again, I have that graph available. If you want to read about most of those 135, it'll give you the biblical reference and the fulfillment of the person in history that we now know confirms that those prophecies came true. And you can email me if you want to, if you want to take a peek at that. Uh, there are a lot of prophecies fulfilled, and we're not going to take the time to go through all of them. We, we just wouldn't have time in 30 minutes to get through even, even, even in a few of them. But let me just point out one example from this section about Egypt and Syria that we now know was fulfilled in history. It's found in verse 6. Let me read verses 6 through 9 in this section of Daniel 11. It says in verse 6, After some years, they will become allies. This is the, these two kings. The daughter of the king of the south will go to the king of the north to make an alliance, but she will not retain her power, and he and his power will not last. In those days, she will be handed over together with her royal escort and her father and the one who supported her. One from her family line will arise to take her place. He will attack the forces of the king of the north and enter his fortress. He will fight against them and be victorious. He will also seize their gods, their metal images, and their valuable articles of silver and gold and carry them off to Egypt. For some years he will leave the king of the north alone. Then the king of the north will invade the realm of the king of the south, but will, but will retreat to his own country. So again, this is reference to these new kings, Egypt and Syria, who have years of conflict um, after Alexander uh, leaves the scene. Um, and we now know from history um, that, that this woman's name referred to here that caused there to be a, 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 a unification of these two kingdoms and to bring peace. Uh, the woman's name was Bernice. Uh, she was daughter of, of Ptolemy II, uh, and she married Antiochus Theos of Syria. Uh, it was a political marriage. In fact, uh, Antiochus had to divorce his first wife to accomplish this, you know, uh, political marriage. But there was hatred and friction. You, you might imagine why, if one wife gets kind of, you know, abandoned and and the family's along with that, and he uh, embraces this new wife and its new political uh, ally, um, and it didn't last. Um, in fact, Bernice was poisoned and killed. As we learn, as we look back through this time period, Antiochus then remarried his first wife, and so when it says that this uh, woman was uh, was didn't retain her position, that's because she was killed. Um, and so what happened is, and, and Daniel already foretold it. We just look back and see it fulfilled. Is that um, Bernice was avenged by her brother, who, who becomes Ptolemy the uh, Third. He attacked Syria. He looted its temples and returned to Egypt with what Josephus, the ancient historian, writes, 4,000 talents of gold, 40,000 talents of silver, and 2,500 objects uh, from the cities and the temples in the north. And he takes them all back to Egypt with him to avenge his sister's death. And that just continues to have, uh, you know... Uh, it, uh, you know, military campaigns and, and battles um, back and forth between these two kingdoms and these two kings. And this is all matches precisely with the prophecy from Daniel. It's really incredible. Um, we're going to go to the fourth section now in this chapter, uh, prophecies concerning Antiochus Epiphanes. If you're following along your notes, it's verses 21 to 35. And again, we're not going to read them all this morning. I'm going to encourage you to, to kind of read through them this week and, and, to, and to, to hold, keep me accountable, to let me know that uh, I'm not sharing anything that's not in there. But we've already been introduced to this most evil of kings uh, in regards to the people of God and Israel. Um, this is some, one of the future kings uh, you know, of Greece. And, and uh, we've already been introduced to him. In fact, he gave himself the name Epiphanes. Antiochus was kind of the title. He gave himself the name Epiphanes, which means glorious, um, since he regarded himself and wanted others to regard him as a god. So he was Antiochus the Glorious, and he gave himself that name. He, he's the first fulfillment of what we've been looking at in this book, uh, what the Bible describes as the abomination that causes desolation. There was a sin that was so abhorrent, 
that caused the temple and the worship of God and the people to be so desolate. Uh, and he did this when he marched into to Jerusalem and he destroyed the worship of God. He replaced it with a statue of Zeus, uh, as well as the sacrifice of, uh, of pigs on, on top of God's altar. Now, history tells us a fascinating story of what led up to this intense persecution of Israel. And if we read throughout this section, you're going to see you know, the description of this future leader. He's described as this little horn in Daniel chapter 8 that comes up of that vision of the ram and the goat. Um, and so we see Antiochus' name throughout history. Now, um, you know, maybe I, I would illustrate this section with a thought of, you know, have you really ever had a bad day at work? <laughs> and, uh, and you're just fuming about it on the way home in the car and, and maybe traffic's bad, just making it worse. And the day is just getting worse and worse and worse. And you're just totally fed up with your boss or your coworker or a situation, a client at work. You finally get home and you're still just so angry that, uh, and you know, as soon as you walk in the door, you're just hoping to kind of have some peace and quiet. But right away, one of your kids like spills something or breaks something or your wife, like you know, uh, husband complains about something and, uh, and then you just lose it. <laughs> you just unleash on them. But, but the punishment doesn't really fit the crime of whatever happens at home. You really are just allowing all the stress, all the frustration, all the anger from your day to just pour out. So what's really coming out of you is not you know, a reaction to what you're involved in at the moment. It's what's already happened. Uh, what happened in the past just comes gushing out. And this is really similar to the situations that, that's referenced here in, in, with Antiochus Epiphanes and his specific you know, uh, you know, atrocities that he uh, exhibited toward the people of God and Israel. This is what happens with Antiochus Epiphanes. This new leader, uh, talked about in verse 21, is the same as this other horn in Daniel chapter 8. And as he rose to power, um, Antiochus Epiphanes actually journeyed to Egypt quite often to gain some easy military victories. In fact, oftentimes Egypt wouldn't even prevent him from marching in and ransacking towns and cities and taking things because they couldn't withstand him. Um, but later, um, as that continued, these invasions took on a, a, a different tone. They took a different turn. In fact, Rome, who's starting to rise to power now, shows up uh, in, with some of their ships uh, and meets Antiochus, and it's referenced here in this section in verse 29 and 30. If you have your Bibles, let me let me encourage you to go there real quick. Verse 29 says this. This is during the reign of Antiochus Epiphanes. It says, at the appointed time, he will invade the south again. So Antiochus is going down toward Egypt to again to, 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 to loot some of these cities and to, to attack them. It says, but this time the outcome will be different from what it was before. Ships of the western coastlands will oppose him, and he will lose heart. Then he will turn back and vent his fury against the Holy Covenant. He will return and show favor to those who forsake the Holy Covenant. So we get a picture here of, uh, of this repeated uh, behavior by Antiochus of going to Egypt and, and, and looting and, and, and causing havoc down there and, and reaping the benefit from that. But something turns. These ships from the coastlands are represented by, by Rome who comes. And, and a story is, is recorded throughout history uh, on this particular invasion. Antiochus meets a Roman fleet commander by the name of Papilius Lionus. Lionus. Um, who demanded that Antiochus return to Palestine. So these two armies meet, and he demands that Antiochus turn around and go to, to, to Palestine. Now, Antiochus said he would consult his advisors about this request, but, but Papilius knew that he was just simply stalling so he could get a bigger army there to meet Rome's army, and so he could match that strength. So Pap uh, history tells us Papilius Lanus literally draws a circle in the sand around Antiochus. And he orders him um, to really summon his counselors and deliberate on the spot. He's like, all right, if you want to talk to your advisors, have them join you in this circle. Because he said, if you step out of that circle without having agreed to return, the Roman officer said, we would declare war on the spot. And now this humiliation, because Antiochus knew he wouldn't be able to match this army. He wasn't prepared. He wasn't ready. Uh, he, I think even in a grand sense, he didn't know if he wanted to start a war with Egypt and Rome. And so he's humiliated in defeat. And before his whole army, before his country, he has to march back home uh, in defeat. Even though he didn't suffer any losses, uh, his humiliation was evident. And so this is what led Antiochus to march into 
Jerusalem and to start to pour out his wrath on them. Again, it wasn't really as a result of going to Jerusalem and not liking those people. He had had a terrible day at the office and he's taken it out on Israel. It actually even tells us here that he's going to um, return and show favor to those who forsake the Holy Covenant. So the people who stand firm in, in their worship of God and, and will not bow to him and worship him as God are going to suffer his wrath. Those who turn away from that are going to be embraced by him and welcomed him in. So this is just, again, a, a glimpse of the things that are going to happen in Daniel's uh, future, now our past. The fourth uh, uh, section I want to point out to you this morning, the final one today, is prophecies concerning the end times. I want to read this final section of, of chapter 11, starting in verse 36. It says this, The, the king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will say unheard of things against the god of gods. He will be successful until the time of wrath is completed, for what has been determined must take place. He will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the one desired by women, nor will he regard any god, but will exalt himself above all of them or them all. Instead of them, he will honor a God of fortresses, a God unknown to his fathers. He will honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. He will attack the mightiest fortresses with the help of a foreign God and will greatly honor those who acknowledge him. He will make them rulers over many people and will distribute the land at a price. Now at the time of the end, uh, the king of the south will engage him in battle. And the king of the north will storm out against him with chariots and cavalry and a great fleet of ships. He will invade many countries and sweep through them like a flood. He will also invade the beautiful land. Many countries will fall, but Edom, Moab, and the leaders of Ammon will be delivered from his hand. He will extend his power over many countries. Egypt will not escape. He will gain control of the treasures of gold and silver and all the riches of Egypt with the Libyans and Nubians in submission. But reports from the east and the north will alarm him, and he will set out in a great rage to destroy and annihilate many. He will pitch his royal tents between the seas at the beautiful holy mountain, yet he will come to his end, and no one will help him. So we get prophecies here in this final section of chapter 11 concerning the end times. Now, not everyone throughout church history, and, and even still today within Christianity, is convinced or agrees that this section is referring to the last days of humanity or the great tribulation period with the Antichrist. Some people believe this might refer to certain sections uh, of history where it was the end times for a certain kingdom, or maybe the Roman Empire, or the Grecian Empire, that the end times refers to the end of that particular kingdom's reign. I personally feel like uh, this is the best option, that this applies to a time that has not yet happened. Uh, but there's still plenty of mystery surrounding the total understanding of the events. As I was reading this week and preparing, uh, one writer puts it this way. He says this, In my opinion, the fact that there are divergent interpretations is the best evidence for concluding that the events referred to are still future. If this section were referring to past events, there's, there's no reason, he writes, it should not be as clear in talking about them as the earlier portions of the chapter have been in talking about the history of ancient Near East from the time of Cyrus to Antiochus Epiphany. So his point is, is that, boy, there's general agreement about the first 35 verses of this chapter that they've already happened. But there's a lot of confusion and disagreement about where how these apply. There's really been no clear application of this happening to this point in time. And so we, we surmise then that this is a, 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 you know really pointing toward a time that has yet to come. Now let me give you just a couple of basic thoughts. I, I left some bullet points in your notes that you can fill in here real quickly. The first one is this, that uh, this, uh, these events are refer fearing, uh, referring to something that's still in the future. It's still coming. This king or this leader and these future conflicts between he and other nations um, and even his uh, residents within the Holy Land, within Jerusalem. Jerusalem, uh, has yet to be uh, realized in history. Um, I also think the second uh, bullet point is that this should be viewed as literal 
um, as the earlier prophecies. So I believe this will happen on earth. It's not some symbol uh, of like, you know, a spiritual struggle or anything like that. There was actual uh, conflict coming that was similar to the conflict that already happened that we read about earlier in this chapter. That's the second bullet point. Now, the third bullet point, if you're taking notes, is that the leader in this section, in my opinion, uh, seems to be the Antichrist. So verse 40 says, particularly there, as we read, it says, at the time of the end, the king of the south. Now, it refers to some of those same titles, the king of the south, the king of the north. In Daniel's day, that was particularly Egypt and Syria. Uh, I think as it refers to the end times, it might be expanded to include a, a, a bigger portion of the north above Israel as well as the south, Egypt and below. And so it could refer to a, a larger section of what's happening on our earth now uh, than, it, than it did in Daniel's day. But this refers to at the time of the end. And this best fits with an understanding of the final days before Jesus' return. If you want to do a, a little more homework this week, you can read Ezekiel 38. Also, Revelation 16 and 19. And this tells us more about the Antichrist, the return of Jesus, the final battle of Armageddon. Uh, it's not a movie about some uh, you know, uh, uh, meteor heading to earth. It's actually about a battle uh, you know, foretold in the Bible when Jesus returns. And these are the events in the final days, the final seven years leading up to Jesus' return. I think Daniel's describing here in Daniel 11, 36 through 45. The final bullet point is that the end of this final conflict will usher in uh, what I would call a, a, a millennial reign, a thousand year reign, literal reign of Jesus on earth, where the earth will be restored uh, back to maybe its original beauty within the Garden of Eden. We'll be able to explore and create with Jesus being our ruler. Uh, Daniel described this, this season earlier, or this ruler, um, in Daniel chapter 7, verse 14, where he wrote, His dominion, Jesus's, is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and His kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So in all these visions of these you know, coming kingdoms, the earthly kingdoms, they were real. I think Jesus' reign will be real. But all these earthly kingdoms had an end in store. And it's a, including the Antichrist. When he comes on the scene and wreaks havoc for those seven years, makes a treaty and breaks it, um, there's an end to that kingdom, but there will be no end to Jesus' reign. Now, even though this is a, a challenging book, Daniel has some great stories and some easy to understand sections and has some difficult, you know, confusing sections as well. I believe we can find great encouragement as we, you know, fi finalize and, and finish this, this section of Daniel. And I hope you've found it. You know, one of the questions that I think we should ask is what do we do with this? Um, what do we do with these former warnings that God gave to Daniel and the people of God, as well as the future warnings that God has given us about what things are coming. You know, Psalm 11, verse 3, asks the question. The psalmist writes, and he says, When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? Um, you know that phrase there, when the foundations are being destroyed. And that can be the foundations of a country, the foundations of morality, the foundations of our life. You know, in Daniel's uh, example, the foundations of, of his king, his kingdom, of his life, of his friendships, they were being destroyed. And the psalmist says, what, what can the righteous do when all that's happening? You know, when Daniel got these warnings about what was going to happen within the nation of Israel, uh, what were the righteous supposed to do? When we have these warnings from Daniel about what's coming until G before Jesus returns, what can we do about that? If the foundations are being destroyed and there's these, these trials that are coming that are going to be really difficult, including the ones that are already here, what can the righteous do? Some of us might read that verse and think, yeah, what can I do? Like, you know, <laughs> all these foundations are being destroyed, so what can I do? I might as well just give up. I'm, I want to just lose hope. I want to lose heart. And I just want to give up and, and turn away and stop following God and stop listening because our, our trials are so painful. I, I, would, I would encourage you and exhort you to, to not take that option. Uh, one old preacher's response that I read about this week, his response to that question by the psalmist is, is this. He just replied, well, what can the righteous do? Well, we go on being righteous, of course. That's what his reply was like. 
when the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? They can go on being righteous like they've always been. And this is what Christ expects of us. This is what Christ expected of Daniel in the midst of the trials he was living in. This was God's expectation of, of the people of God as they were going to face trials from Antiochus Epiphanes and many others since. This is what Christ expects of us today. And that's why he gives us these warnings so we can be prepared to endure. Now I want to close with this. When Antiochus Epiphanes uh, rose up to try and destroy uh, the people of God and the temple of God and the worship of God, you know, a family within the people of God named the, Ma- the Maccabees uh, rose up and, and, and resisted him physically, literally. Uh, they rose up to, to battle against this evil. Led by this man, Judas Maccabees, the Israelites rose up during this time of of great trial, uh, great great persecution, great abomination within the temple. They rose up and eventually defeated Antiochus Epiphanes and restored worship uh, of the one true God. I want to go back and close with this. Daniel chapter 11 verse 31 refers to this season. And I skipped over it on purpose. I want to close with this. Verse 31 and 32 says this, His armed forces will rise up to desecrate the temple fortress and will abolish the daily sacrifice. So after that episode where the Roman commander drew the circle in the sand around Antiochus and his advisors and they gave up in defeat, in humiliation they returned. And this is what happened. This is his response. They desecrated the temple. They abolished the daily sacrifice. It it goes on. It says, Then they will set up the abomination that causes desolation. That's either the statue of Zeus and a new worship of him, or the fact that they worshiped, you know, pigs and other unclean animals on the altar of God, either one or the combination of. It says, verse 32, With flattery he will corrupt those who have violated the covenant. So he's going to flatter some of the Israelites and lead them astray. But it says this, But the people who know their God will firmly resist him. Yeah, I mean, not great that there's going to be people within the people of God who are swept away uh, by the flattery of this, this leader, Antiochus Epiphanes. But the people who know their God will firmly resist him. I actually love the way, as I read this week, the way the King James Version quotes this verse. The King James actually says, The people that do know their God shall be strong and and do exploits. (laughs) That's a great word. Uh, They'll be strong and do exploits. My question is, is what about you, church? Uh, Are you willing to be strong in the midst of the trials you're facing? Are Are you willing to turn to the God of strength who will give you the endurance to endure all the things that are coming, the warnings that he's told us about, to find your strength in God and the promise of eternity that he and he alone can deliver? And then once you find that strength, are you ready to do exploits for God? I looked up exploits, and it's a great definition. There's a couple different, uh, you know, uh, applications of that word. The first is to make full use of and derive benefit from. The second means that when you do exploits, you're doing something bold, a bold or daring feat. So my question to us is, are we ready to make full use of, of the time and talents God has given you for Him and His glory and His fame. If doing exploits mean to make, make full use of and to derive benefit from, we want to make full use of what God has given us within the church. Um, and then, are you ready to do something bold or daring for Him? I'm even talking about this week. What, what, what might it be? I mean, think about that for a second. What bold, daring feat might God lead you to do this week? Maybe, uh, you know, it's not as bold as standing up to a tyrant named Antiochus Epiphanes like the Maccabees did and and many others who joined him. Maybe it's not standing up to the Antichrist yet, although that may happen in our lifetimes. We don't know. What if it were something bold and daring like loving your spouse? (laughs) It may not seem so grand as as some of the exploits of Daniel and others, but, but it might be an exploit God might lead you in this week. What if it might be an exploit of reaching out to a neighbor or a coworker to love them or serve them, even if they don't deserve it? What if it might be an exploit of connecting with a friend that you've been estranged from, whether 
you know, because of a disagreement or because uh, one of you has been struggling and you've uh, become disconnected, I would, I would encourage you uh, to pray and ask the Lord to reveal what exploits He wants you to do for Him this week. Let me close us in prayer. Holy Spirit, we know that uh, you're with us, that you're living in us for those of us who know you. We know that uh, you, you uh, encourage us and you, you whisper truth and remind us of what God has revealed in Scripture. And, uh, and Holy Spirit, we trust you. And I would just pray that you would reveal to each person who might be watching this, listening to this, what exploits you want them to do this very week, how they can live out their faith, how they can stand up to uh, evil or, or the things that are pulling them or others away, and they can actually uh, you know, do something bold and daring for you. And, and I pray that, Lord, you would give us the courage to go out in your name and in your power and to do them for your glory and your sake, and for the sake of others who have yet to know you, Lord. And so, Lord, we long to be that that people, uh, that, that future generations, if you uh, don't return, will read about and be encouraged because of our faith response to you. Just like Daniel, just like so many others have responded to you, Lord, we want to be those people this week. So encourage us, challenge us, and motivate us to live for you, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, again, thanks for joining us. Uh, If you didn't uh, already pull up the online Connect card, we'd love to know how we can pray for you, encourage you. If God leads you into a specific response of reaching out to somebody you want us to pray with you, either before or after that, let us know. And let us know how God uses you in the life of others this week. God bless you. Have a great week.